apologize. Um, I'm partly doing a takeover as part of my participation, so that's also what I apologize for that. So anyway, um, third and final act of A Working Miracle. Uh, for those who missed the previous two acts, this is essentially a short, not a short novel of short stories around the past, present, future, and future of work, where we were, where we are, and where we're going. So in this last section, it's primarily about the future based or like future potential cities or, or planets or, or situations. So I'm just going to read three, set, three different uh, sections from this or maybe four. And yeah, I'll just do it. Thank you. So we begin with. So it begins, I arrive in District 27, now the largest city in the world with 70 million. Upon arrival, I'm instructed that if I stay here longer than two months, I'm liable to be drafted into SWAPS, the productivity program, unless able to show talent succeed in that or regular society for which you would receive ample benefits. The majority have succumbed to receiving universal wage and any formerly necessary roles are now overseen by a small select number of humans and a sole mainframe computer. San, one may wonder what the citizens do with their time, pretty much leisure and swaps. A more humane response than simply wiping out everyone, the overseers prefer that casual citizens were kept alive and healthy. So, every month a large percentage of citizens are set various tasks that will take up their time mainly product testing for human capabilities, new organs and other modified body parts, as well as observation tasks with breaks too. All cruelty free, I have been told. Not overstaying my welcome, I briskly leave after a few weeks as I'd prefer to scurry elsewhere. And the second one begins. A great quote states, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. And the city of Ruderia seems to have embedded this in its DNA. Several millennia of human warfare. As soon as a particular enemy had been felled, another one had arrived soon after. The advent of gene editing spurred two desires. One for stronger crops, also capable of being grown on arid land and two, a desire for animals to potentially work better for them against their external enemies. Which, of course, then extended the serious threats from solely human to potentially all creatures from the animal kingdom. Enhanced vultures came and covered the sky, but were soon cleared off. Snakes capable of growing legs and burrowing underground came to pull the floor from beneath us. However, they were soon stomped out. The spiders with poison threads which were set alight to keep at bay to the concrete-eaten termites that arrived just before winter. They fortunately were able to exterminate, and many other creatures and diseases that were unable to cease human reign. But nothing lasts forever, and so long had Ruderia been domesticated, it was unexpected, to say the least, when the flora began to attack. Um, the third goes, never have I ever been to a place which celebrates life more than Cirrus. A place of few, the population may number no more than several hundred. However, in the hundreds of years I've been to and from the city, that number hasn't changed. No deaths, no births. Obviously attributed to the cyborg revolution, I was told the creation of indestructible organs and brain-computer interfaces, amongst other things, incited unmatched levels of violence to trim the fat and regulate the population. Fast forward to today, and there is much regret mixed with other feelings in the hearts of Syrians. As such, over time, Cirrus has created an identical copy of their world to house the dead. Those who lost their lives were taken there to continue and celebrate what was lost. Sat at tables in positions of rest, dancing, reading, being dressed in the clothes of the time, working, etc. Every so often, a selected group of Syrians who created the copy are tasked with going back and forth to check on the space and make sure nothing has decayed and been damaged too much. However, they say every time they visit, something has been changed in the space by the corpses. 
so much so it is incomparable to the living city. It may be the result of years of reflection. Either way, fellow Ceresians took, this information, took to this information and began to replicate that which the grave keepers had told them. However, many I've spoken to now would say this is nothing new, and in fact the dead built the living city. It is to say, between the two worlds, there is no telling who is living and who is dead. And the final one goes, but before I read the final one, um, these are essentially, the future section of this novel is essentially um, alternate versions of where some of the potential places in the book would end up based on the way that we allow society to move forward. So hopefully we can divert some of this path. But anyway, the final section goes, the planet which achieved it all, Dolos, Across the board, it is said to have achieved world peace and no lives were lost in the process. Work was part of all life but balanced and of minimal time consumption. All borders have been destroyed. Ingenuity reached its apex. Medical advances meant no one died or was ever afflicted by diseases or ailments. Technological advancements meant they had become a type, v, type four civilization on the updated Kardashian scale. Every problem which ever affected any society was no longer a problem on Dolos. Diplomats who spend their lives in transit and conversation, space explorers who arrive back with all kinds of places with new materials, naval teams who spend most of their lives at sea, look down and speak of Dolos. Sometimes sparks of light are seen in the sky and people wonder if there is a celebration taking place, maybe some kind of festival. Many look down from varying heights about what is going on there, the types of conversations, and what takes up the time of the average Delosian. Although they have no intention of visiting, Dolos is also far too risky to travel for them. But it serves as an anchor for the thoughts and eyes of those who stay at lofty heights. Apol and Artem, so these are the two, two of the main characters in the story, were expecting to hear what it was like on the planet and how the people were but Lavoro, the main character, is basically Italian for work, uh, cannot speak further as he has yet to find out which planet it is. It has never been clearly identified, and if you were within its orbit, it would be a different place. For those who pass it without entering, the planet is one thing. It is another for those who are trapped by it and never leave. And that's it. Thank you very much.